Hello, Gaspar. Salut, Ella. How are you? I'm very well. How are you? Uh, I'm cold. I spent the whole day tasting in cold cellars in Burgundy, and there's been freezing fog outside. So, freeze <laughs> all day long. Never mind. Well, time to get cozy talking about our latest Burgundy study. So, I wanted to thank you for collaborating um, with us on the just published Burgundy study by Wine Lister um, and bringing your on the ground expertise into the mix. Um, I just reread your, your foreword um, and one of the things that you, you talk about is this prejudice, or seeming prejudice against the Maison de Negos um, versus the domain. And what I thought was interesting is that you highlighted that actually the norm until the 1990s was not for domain bottling. So it seems ironic. Were you surprised um, that this prejudice seemed to come out of the results of our survey? Yes, I was, because I don't feel it on the ground anymore. Uh, but I did, having heard the questions from your survey, I did actually ask the opinion of several of the larger negotiants and they confirmed that there is a prejudice against them. That's how they see it in the marketplace. Okay. And I think it's deserved. Okay. And why don't you think it's deserved? Well, partly because so many of them uh, own vast uh, domains themselves. And indeed, what we see in the international marketplaces, unless you buy their generic Bourgogne, you typically you see much more of the uh, domain wines. And they've got smart people running the winemaking, and they've got big teams out there in the vineyards and I can't see why there needs to be a difference. Okay, so perhaps it's a communication issue more than a real quality issue. Yes, except that implies there's something that they could do about it. And at the moment, the mountain just seems to be, the hurdles just seem to be a little bit too high because they are pretty smart at communicating. It's not completely fair. I mean, what we should be doing is just tasting the wine and judging it and leaving it at that. Okay. And often the Negos wines, as a result, are less um, insanely expensive for some of the top wines. So perhaps we should be suggesting that people collect and drink those wines. Well, it can vary. Um, but in any case, when you think of pricing, you tend to think of the market price. That isn't necessarily the price that's left the producer. Mm -hmm. but, uh, certainly, there is some pretty good value to be had from the Negosians in their own vineyards in the sort of middle to upper level, which are less sought after than, as it might be a Domaine Rousseau, Domaine Rumier, where it's almost impossible to get it at the first price. Yeah, okay. So in our survey, 83% of our founding members, um, so that's over 50 key members of the fine wine trade globally, 83% um, have more confidence in the image of domains than in the image of Maison de Negros. And we're saying that that's not justified. So Jasper's first top tip would be look for quality and value amongst the negociants. Uh, I think that's a, a very good place to look if you can't already get what you want uh, elsewhere. Okay. Um, so in terms of uh, top tips, another thing that came out of our survey when asking those same founding members um, about risks and opportunities was on the risk side, and you also men mentioned this in your foreword, global warming, and on the opportunity side, some of the um, sub-regions or appellations that have actually perhaps been helped by global warming. Yes. Would you like to elaborate? Yes, so, so we are clearly in a new era now with global warming, particularly strong in the vintages from 2018 onwards, signs of it coming out before then. And people are gonna to have to react, we won't go into the detail, but they're gonna to have to react in the way they grow their grapes and a little bit how they make their wine in order to mitigate uh, any of the downsides of global warming. But it's probably doable unless things get a lot worse. Mm. Uh, what we can also say is that one or two favourite vineyards or villages are perhaps a little bit less favoured by this. Any, anywhere where the grapes used to ripen early is more at risk. Um, on the other hand, places where the soils tended to be rather humid, which typically has given rather firm tannins, they're now doing a lot better. 
So, so, so name, name, name Omar. some appellations it favours. Pomar, absolutely. Chevre Chambertin as well. Mm -hmm. The Grand Clos Vougeot, uh, the 2019s have been tasting are really smart, and 2018s good too. You could also net parts of Corton, the sort of Alos Corton side of it, um, which I always tended to avoid. It's looking better. And then the inverted commas back villages like Osidurus, Saruman, Montli, and so on. Okay, so interestingly, interestingly, when we asked um, our founding members in the recent survey for opportunities within Burgundy, a lot of the regions or appellations that they mentioned were not necessarily the ones you just have mentioned. So the ones that came out top were the Maconnais, Beaujolais, mm -hmm. the Côte mm -hmm. Chalonnais, and saint aubin mm -hmm. Would you agree that those are opportunity areas? Or? Well, uh, apart perhaps from saint aubin none of them are in the terms of global warming making a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, Beaujolais, they're much further south, they were warm enough already, Côte Chalonnais too. But in terms of where there's good quality and at a very fair price, yeah, absolutely, uh, okay. absolutely, they are opportunities, yes. And you don't think that they're at more risk from global warming than other areas necessarily? No, I suppose it could change a little bit within the Mackinac, which sub-districts uh, do well. Um, but uh, on the whole, no, I, don't, I wouldn't see that. Maybe parts of the Coach Chalonais could be at risk. Um, but uh, these are the areas which have never quite found the favour which uh, I probably think they deserve. And so the prices have typically been quite low. And there are now more and more really good individual people making nice wine there. It makes me think of um, Dominique Lafon's FGT, Futur Grand Terroir. All right, yes, yes. Have you heard him talk about that? Yes, absolutely. That I was just worried for a minute that he, he might have been impolite in his, uh, his three-letter acronym, but no. <laughs> <laughs> no, this one was quite. Future uh, Grand Terroir, we'll do it. We'll do it yeah. in French. Yes. <laughs> um, any other um, tips in terms of undervalued or underappreciated areas to look out for? Well, actually, one which I thought was going to be negative because we had been saying initially that the quality was moving up the hillside with uh, global warming. But actually, some of the lands at the bottom, the Bourgogne lands uh, at the foot of the hill in the Cote d'Or which typically are, are quite deep soils and retaining the water, uh, they're looking fine. Um, we'll see a little bit more action in the Haute Côte, the villages which are tucked away well, well, they're much higher up and they're sort of behind the main escarpment. Uh, so we'll see more action there. Um, and uh, otherwise, one or two of the, the little places, it does really depend on whether you've got, going to have a, a good enough water source. That's going to be the key. Okay. So um, the only risk that was cited more often than global warming uh, was mm. prices. Yes. Um, obviously a hot topic and has been for a long time in Burgundy. And we yes. saw in um, the analysis that we've just undertaken that in fact, uh, the wine lister Piedmont index has overtaken for the first time in the last year, the wine lister Burgundy index and we've seen lots of interesting things um, in the study to do with price for example many more wines now priced over the three thousand pounds a bottle mark than they were a couple of years ago um, and <laughs> that's the secondary market that's done that yeah with one possibly two ex one exception i would say nobody's pricing their wine like that leaving burgundy so no. that that's an indication that the secondary market is prepared to pay those sorts of prices. Yeah. And if the secondary market falls back from there, it's not really going to change uh, what's happening in Burgundy because uh, the, their prices went up there. Um, so okay. uh, prices went up quite sharply. There's a mixture of enormously increased demand plus those very short vintages of 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And again, a little bit 19 and 20, but the 12 to 16 were very short. 17 and 18 were big crops. Prices should have stabilized and in fact should have come down and didn't, didn't come down. Possibly in some cases hadn't even stabilized. And any further up, upward uh, pressure is and should be resisted. Okay. And I, um, 
I wanted to ask you about the wider economic and political context because you cited that um, yes. in your foreword as being a kind of worrying background, I think, for burgundy prices. And I just wondered whether you felt that Trump's imminent departure might be a relief to Burgundians. Um, it is a relief in the sense that it takes away the threat of the 100% tax. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody is expecting the 25% tax to be removed immediately. I think that will take longer. After all, those are reciprocal taxes from both sides. So, so it's not going to sort itself out completely, but at least an, a, a worse downside has been avoided. But there are still political issues in Asia, and there is obviously a Brexit issue for the UK. So you know, everybody is conscious that uh, times could be difficult. Plus, of course, anybody whose main business, whether directly in France or through their importers and other markets, anybody who's concentrated on the restaurant business is looking very worried at the moment. Yes, exactly. With many restaurants having been closed for much of this year. And they probably won't reopen in the same number or even in the same form or necessarily with the same sorts of wine lists either. Mm -hmm. Do you think That's that presents a, an opportunity? Do you think that presents an opportunity for producers to rethink their distribution? Uh, certainly, a need uh, to. I mean, it may well be that importers and other markets who have concentrated on restaurants will be doing the rethinking, and that they can continue to work through the main same producers. But I think the idea of trying to get to the end consumer more quickly is probably in their minds. Yeah. That sounds about right. Um, okay, well, they were the main topics that I wanted to discuss with you because I think they were the ones that had jumped out at you from the various pieces of analysis that, that are, appear in our study. Was there anything else that you found particularly of note or surprising? Um, because obviously your view from the ground is not necessarily going to be the same as the view of the importers, distributors, merchants, auction houses responding to our wine list of survey? Yes, I mean, so much focus this year on the difficulties uh, relating to COVID and the fact that um, I have been able to taste, it, is, uh, uh, it has been allowed for professional tasting to continue. Mm -hmm. In fact, there are just three or four journalists circulating, almost no importers circulating. So uh, the producers are, if, if they can communicate at all, either with the end customer or indeed with their importers, it's only through Zoom, possibly supplemented by tasting samples. Um, fortunately, 2019 looks like a vintage that there is going to be a real thirst for. Um, so probably it's not going to feel like a crisis come uh, the beginning of the year, but uh, everybody's aware that um, these are uncertain times. Okay. Well, let's hope that you're right about the feeling come January, and that's a relatively positive note to end on. Absolutely. Okay. So, let us all go and have a nice glass of Burgundy. Exactly. Thank you, Jasper. Great to see you, Anna. Thank you.